My name is Sarah Tishkoff, and I'm a professor in departments of genetics and biology at the University of Pennsylvania. How did you first become interested in science? I actually first got interested through anthropology. So I think my earliest memory of being interested in anthropology was reading a book by Margaret Mead on Samoans as a high school student. And somehow I got it in my mind, I'm going to be an anthropologist. <laughs> and so I went to UC Berkeley, which happens to have one of the best anthropology departments. And particularly at that time, it was what we call this classic four-field approach. So getting both biological anthropology courses and cultural anthropology and linguistics. We had to learn linguistics and archaeology. And um, at that time at UC Berkeley, uh, there was a brilliant scientist named Alan Wilson. And Alan Wilson was one of the founders of what I would call, I guess, molecular anthropology. So, for example, many of his um, academic offspring have gone on to do brilliant things, so including Svante Pabo, who uh, did his first ancient DNA work in his lab, Mary Claire King, who went on to identify, you know, BRCA1, breast cancer uh, risk uh, related gene, and so on. So when I was there um, in the anthropology department, there was someone named Vince Sarich, and he was a student of Alan Wilson. And he started talking about how we could use genetic data to learn about human origins and essentially to ask the question, what is it that makes us unique? What is it that makes us human? <laughs> As opposed to our closest genetic relatives, the chimpanzee. And so I really started out with those fundamental questions about human origins, what it is that makes us uniquely human, and for some time, I was studying primate behavior. And um, actually, for my honors thesis, I studied a troop of baboons that were in the Oakland Zoo. But at the same time, I recognized that I needed to have the genetic skills if I wanted to be able to address questions uh, in terms of learning about history through genetics. So I decided to double major in genetics and um, took all the coursework and then did lab work with uh, both Mary Claire King and George Sensaba, and George was another student of Alan Wilson's, and he actually um, was one of the first labs to work on forensic applications of DNA. So my, <laughs> my job in his lab, that was actually the working on the very first PCR machine. Now I'm really dating myself. <laughs> yeah, so Cetus Corporation had the very first PCR machine, and we worked together with them to do HLA typing using that PCR machine. And uh, so we were looking at hairs. I was like plucking hairs, looking at drawing them and looking at how much DNA we could get and then seeing if we could use that to get forensic information. And uh, in Mary Claire's lab, I was working on um, a uh, family in, I believe it was Costa Rica that has um, hereditary deafness and trying to identify uh, gene, the gene or genes that play a role in that disorder. And then after that, when I was going to graduate school, um, I went to work with Kenneth Kidd, who's at Yale, and he, together with Luca Cavalli-Sforza, who was at Stanford, had put together the largest collection at that time, I think, um, of globally diverse uh, ethnic group cell lines from globally diverse ethnic groups. Now, and that was great because it gave myself and others an opportunity to characterize diversity on a global level and to be able to address questions we were interested in. But um, at the time, the only African populations they had were two so-called pygmy populations um, who are from the Central African rainforest. They're traditionally hunter-gatherers. And one of them is called the Mbuti, and they're from sort of the eastern region, the DRC, and then the uh, Biaka, who are from uh, Central African Republic. And we later discovered that they're not at all representative of Africans. And um, the other thing that I did when I was in graduate school is I took a year to go study abroad because I had never had an opportunity to do that. And um, had a fellowship to go to Svante Pabo's lab this is before he was super famous and well-known, and he was just at the beginning of starting to do his ancient DNA work. And um, I was interested actually in using, um, studying retroposable elements, so like alu elements, 
there are hundreds of thousands of these in the human genome, and they seem to be making copies of themselves and then jumping around the genome. And I thought, well, they'll be a great marker if I want to trace ancestry. Maybe I could find one that jumped into the common ancestor of the Native American populations, and maybe we could trace their um, ancestry back to Siberia or wherever they may have originated. Um, and that turned out not to work so well because the family of these alu elements that are jumping around are really similar to all the other alus. And at the time, the technology didn't really allow us to differentiate them. But then the other interest I had was uh, looking at microsatellites. So short tandem repeats, highly variable, often used in forensics. And again, at that time, they were new, <laughs> newly discovered. We didn't know much about their mutation rate. And I thought, what if we combine these um, ALU insertion deletions, very stable mutations, with looking at flanking microsatellites? And maybe together looking at them as a haplotype, so their association along a chromosome would be informative. And at that time, King Kids Lab was talking a lot about haplotypes. And then um, we might also learn something about the mutation mechanism of the microsatellites. And so I happened to, perhaps it was partly luck, <laughs> that um, there was a locust that had um, an alu insertion deletion and it had a microsatellite nearby. And it was at the CD4 gene that actually also plays a role in immunity. These were in non-coding regions. And um, when I started looking at the haplotype diversity there, I noticed that the patterns, if I looked amongst the European populations, it was pretty similar. Most of the populations were similar to each other. And the Asian populations were similar to each other. And they weren't so different from each other. But when I looked in the few African populations that we had, they were totally different. So I thought, well, that's intriguing. And so I started um, contacting people uh, who had might have access to African DNA because there was so little at that time. And um, the few people, Trevor Jenkins was one of the earliest people to do research on African genetics in uh, Southern Africa. He was at University of the Witwatersrand. And then um, Giovanni Destro Basal, who is in Italy, also had some samples from Cameroon. Um, there were a number of people just basically contacted them, was able to gather some samples from maybe, I think it was like maybe eight or nine populations. And again, was just astounded by how different they were from each other. So not only did they have a lot of variation, but amongst them, they were super different. And we were able to reconstruct human evolution looking at this um, haplotype that came from the nuclear genome. And at that time, all the studies were being done on the mitochondrial DNA, which is inherited just through the maternal lineage. And in fact, Alan Wilson was the one who published the big paper on mitochondrial Eve. Um, so that was what was going on at the time. And ours was the first paper that used the nuclear genome to try to trace that evolutionary history. And we argued for a single origin in Northeast Africa. Um, and it's ironic because, again, I mean, we studied populations from Melanesia, not from Aus Australia, but from many other places. And I didn't see any evidence at that time for a separate migration wave into that region some people have argued that there were two migrations out of Africa, maybe an earlier one that went into Southeast Asia. That may be true, but if it was, it looked to me at that time that it was from the same source population in Africa. And now that we have whole genome sequence data, people are going back to that argument. <laughs> so I think it's actually held up after all this time. How did the Human Genome Diversity Project and the International Haplotype Map Project influence your work? So before I answer that, I just realized I want to oh, go back to sure. some of the history because that will actually come in <laughs> in a moment. So um, after I did my PhD work with Ken Kidd, I went to work with Andy Clark, who's a brilliant population geneticist, um, working at that time mainly on fruit flies and also doing theory. He was at Penn State at the time. He's now at Cornell. And I was really lucky that I got a um, Burroughs Welcome Fund Career Award. And that gave me funding to essentially run my own little lab within Andy Clark's lab. So I had my little human genetics lab. I bought my own PCR machine, my own reagents. I had undergrad working with me. And sort of then I had this brilliant you know, person to talk about ideas and get advice and mentorship. So it was like to me one of the best <laughs> times of my life, my research career.
And at that time, we were studying uh, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. Mutations in that cause um, uh, deficiency in that enzyme. It can cause severe disease, including anemia. And in fact, it can be triggered by certain drugs used to treat uh, malaria or by certain foods like fava beans and people who have a mutation common in the Mediterranean. And we were able to show that this mutation arose recently in Africa, the most common one called the A-minus mutation arose within the past 10,000 years and then swept to high frequency. And we could show that by looking at patterns of linkage disequilibrium. There was like a haplotype that rose to high frequency. And we estimated the age to be about within 10,000 years. And that corresponded with the introduction of agriculture. Um, so it seems like it was consistent with malaria being a strong selective force within the past 10,000 years. But before even I started on that project, literally within, I think, a month or so after I got to Andy Clark's lab, I took off. <laughs> and so, and he was such a nice guy. He was like, okay, sure, go and do a little mini postdoc or visiting scientist position at Trevor Jenkins' lab in South Africa. So for about five months or so, um, I went to uh, Johannesburg. I was at University of Vatersrand. This was in ninety. 697, it was an interesting time because it was just after the end of apartheid and they were having the, uh, I think it was called the reconciliation mm -hmm. and they were filming this. So because I lived in a place called Hillbrow, which is a really dangerous area of Johannesburg, that's where the research institute was. I stayed on a cottage at the institute and I couldn't leave. Literally, it just like had a fortress walls, like 15 feet high. It was a very dangerous area. And so I would just walk to work. I'd go there, you know, I could go there at night or any time. And then I'd watch TV. And through watching TV, I learned about all they did was play these, these um, videos of what was going on. So I learned a huge amount about the history of um, South Africa and the politics and so on. And um, Trevor Jenkins had access to many diverse African populations from Southern Africa. And again, I was able to continue to see how much diversity was out there. And then... Uh, during that trip, there was a meeting in Cape Town, and that meeting was on the um, history of the Khoisan-speaking populations, uh, the ones who speak with cliques, commonly referred to as the San hunter-gatherers, you know, traditionally hunter-gatherers. And even at that time, Alan Wilson's lab had shown that they had the oldest genetic lineages. So if you look at the mitochondrial DNA tree, their lineages were kind of at the earliest root of this tree. So their ancestors were, you know, ancestral to all modern humans. And so they're also different because they speak this click language and they have some different morphological features. They're kind of light-skinned and look a little bit different from other African populations. And they, at that time, were still continuing to practice hunting and gathering. And that meeting brought together um, anthropologists, uh, linguists, archaeologists, um, geneticists, and then representatives of all of those uh, communities from the San communities who actually came to this meeting and spoke about their history and what they wanted people to learn and what, you know, they were sort of participants in this discussion. And at that meeting, after talking to these really diverse group of people, I said, well, what would be the most interesting question I could answer about population history of the, of the San? And they said, you should go to Tanzania and you should study the Hadza and the Sandawe, who also speak with cliques, but their language is really different from the San. How are they related? What are they doing up in East Africa, the San, or in Southern Africa? What's their relationship? And that's what got me started. So I decided to focus on those populations. And um, just coincidentally, Joanna Mountain, who at the time was at Stanford University, and she's now at 23andMe, she also was interested in those populations. So we joined forces and said, why don't we put together a grant to NSF? And as a postdoc wrote this grant that got accepted. So I got my first NSF grant as a postdoc together with Joanna Mountain. And then right after we got that and we were getting ready to go do the field work, my plan was to initiate it while still a postdoc in Andy Clark's, Clark's lab. And the government shut down all research. And that lasted for three years <laughs> on that particular population we were going to study. So they were unhappy that they felt like um, the researchers might be riling up the people um, against the government or something and asking for land rights and this and that. 
And so they were just going to stop all research. So I got an NSF grant and then <laughs> couldn't use it for three years. And uh, the people at NSF were very understanding and I was able to sort of roll it over until eventually I could. And uh, in 2000, I started a faculty position at University of Maryland. And it was after I took that position that finally I could go and start doing field work initially in Tanzania. And that was sort of the start of uh, the initiation of my career trying to better characterize um, genetic diversity throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. So now I wanted to get to your question about um, the diversity project, the human diversity project and the HAP map. So I was in Ken Kidd's lab and um, so was very well aware of the human diversity project and he worked together with Luca Cavalli Sforza. I thought it was very important and really was the only resource for studying diversity um, in global populations. The problems that they had at the time, however, is that at that time, um, you know, there wasn't really the same kind of uh, ethical review that we have go through today, and there were no written informed consent forms often. And I think science was just done in a different way at that time. Um, and so that caused a bit of a backlash. And so people, ethicists, um, sociologists, uh, some of the indigenous populations were upset because they felt like they didn't know what their samples were going to be used for. And then, um, so that rose, that was good to have that discussion, I think. And then when the HapMap project started, one of the things that I really appreciate that they did is that they always considered the ethical, legal, and social issues. And that was like right there from the start, making sure that they were getting community consent and they spent a lot of time, you know, trying to do this in an ethical manner and avoiding those problems. Um, and then the data that they collected was, of course, crucial for many people's studies, my own included, because they characterized um, uh, what were known about single nucleotide polymorphisms at that time. And then they, and there weren't a huge number, so it was in like, what was it, hundreds of thousands, maybe. <laughs> um, and then they uh, looked at haplotypes, so they looked at how they're associated different variants or associated lung chromosome as a haplotype and that was super important because we were just at the beginning of genome-wide association studies where you're trying to look at markers across the genome find an association with whatever trait you're looking for and in theory you see a strong association it should be linked nearby but the problem is that different populations may have very different patterns of linkage disequilibrium and these haplotypes some of the variants may not tag a haplotype containing that gene that uh, whatever the trait is you're looking at, whatever mutation is causing that trait. And so it was informative for, for constructing projects, interpreting projects, really useful for looking at human evolutionary history. Uh, people like um, uh, Ben Voigt uh, created in Jonathan Pritchard's lab some statistics for looking at um, long haplotypes and also party sabeti, extended haplotype homozygosity. And those could be applied to the HapMap uh, variants to look at signatures of selection in global populations. So that was definitely a really important first step. And it seemed like from that, that was sort of, uh, what, how do I say this? Um, I think the HapMap project led to the Thousand Genomes project which then took it sort of a step further, used many of the same populations, then added on some additional populations, and then started applying the newest uh, next generation sequencing technology to do whole genome sequencing. So we're getting a lot more information about genetic variation. Um, and I certainly applaud them on that. It's been invaluable for anybody. If you're, if you have any gene of interest, you know, we can go look it up and and see what it's, what's the frequency of this variant in the thousand genomes. Um, is it something unique to my population or do you see it on a, on a global level? And in fact, if you're looking for um, a variant that might be causative of disease, a pathogenic variant, you're gonna wanna know, do I see it in other populations? Because if I do, then maybe it's not so pathogenic. Maybe it's, it's more common than I thought. So it was a great start. Um, but clearly there needs to be more done in terms of including uh, more ethnically diverse populations and particularly in Africa because there is so much diversity amongst ethnic groups there. 
and all the populations they included. And this was actually part of the strategy. I was on the advisory board. And so I'm familiar with some of the uh, discussions that went on. But the idea at the time, I didn't necessarily agree with them. <laughs> I actually was pushing for studying more diverse populations. But the argument was, let's look at some that are kind of similar to each other. Because that way we'll gain power. We could better pool our data together and maybe uh, gain power for trying to identify rare variants that aren't so common. It, you gain power if you see that variant in other populations. But the problem is that all those populations speak a language. Uh, it's called niger kordofanian that comes from West Africa. And the history is that um, a subset of that of people who spoke those languages called Bantu speakers came from around kind of the border of Nigeria and Cameroon. And they migrated across Africa to the east and south um, and then uh, admixed with many of the local populations. And that was referred to as the Bantu migration. And one of the things they had was iron tool technology so they could cut down the trees, move into the forest, grow their, in population size because they had agriculture and they were really successful, really altered the genomic landscape. But what that means is that you can be looking at a group in East Africa that speaks that language or a group in Southern Africa that speaks that language, but they all came from Western Africa within just a few thousand years. So it misses a lot of the diversity that's out there. And that was something that um, my lab did after I was a faculty member and we started doing field work in Africa and started collecting samples and then um, did a study with the Marshfield Institute where at that time they were doing microsatellite typing, which was quite challenging. Um, and we did that in over 3,000 Africans from over 220, I think, ethnic groups. And it still, to my knowledge, remains the biggest study to date in terms of the diversity of the ethnic groups. Um, and we learned a huge amount about looking at population structure and ancestry and history and tracing migration events. And it really helped us to understand how diverse Africa is, not just within, but between populations. Can you talk a bit more about the planning and logistics that went into the study that you did with the Marshfield Institute? I went there in um, in 2001. So I got that NSF grant and they held it. I couldn't use it for three years. Then in 2001, they gave me the green light and they said, yes, you can go and start doing research. Now, I had never done field work. I was kind of chained to the lab bench <laughs> in graduate school. There was no way I was going to be able to go do field work. And I did not have any training. So I had no idea what I'm doing. I literally just like, I called some people. I tried to research um, methodologies for preserving the DNA because we have no electricity in many of the regions we're going to. We study mainly minority populations in Africa that practice indigenous lifestyles and they're in really rural, really remote areas. You have to have a four wheel drive vehicle. I didn't know where am I gonna sleep? What am I gonna eat? <laughs> um, how am I going to hook up my a centrifuge there? How am I going to do this? I had to basically practice in our lab. So we did everything in our lab and practiced and found that, okay, it works pretty well. We can use this buffer to lyse the white cells. We spin them down. We lyse the white cells. And it's stable, actually pretty stable. And it worked beautifully. But I didn't know that <laughs> until I went there. And then I went there, um, put together a team with my collaborator. You always have to have a good local collaborator. And they should be playing an active role, which luckily um, they were. And uh, we just went out there and just blindly sort of <laughs> went out and figured out the best way to do this. And I think the other thing that really helped us is we were really careful from the very start to do this in the most ethical way possible. So at that time, there were a lot of people who were traveling into places like Africa with no research permits often didn't have any informed consent, just went in, they go in and take cheek swabs, you know, and that was common at that time, just take cheek swabs to get DNA, no permission. And I figured I'm going to do this the right way because it's going to take me a lot longer, but it's going to be better in the long run. It will mean that I can have a long-term project, not just a go in there, fly in, take it, you know, and leave and build up something that would be long, longer lasting. And I, ha I'm so glad we did that. And the other foresight we had is to get blood. Again, people thought we're crazy because it's really challenging. You can imagine going out to these remote areas and collecting blood samples from hundreds of people. 
very, very challenging. And then having to process that, it was not easy. We worked from seven in the morning until one or 2 a.m. We started all over again the next day. It was some of the hardest work I've ever done in my life, but also the most exciting. Um, it was interesting to lead this as a woman in Africa because they weren't really used to having women as leaders. So <laughs> had a little bit of issues at the beginning with one of the male uh, assistants who kind of liked to be the boss and didn't like it when I <laughs> said, no, I'm actually the boss. But um, at the same time, I had wonderful people who worked with us and were very supportive. And after time, got to learn more about the culture and of the different groups we were working with. And um, we go back and we bring results back to people and we keep them informed. They really, really appreciate that. And we're trying to do long-term research. And then after Tanzania, we expanded <laughs> to many different regions. So partly because I had a lot of, I did a lot of training of African postdocs and graduate students. And so I had a Nigerian postdoc. So she went to Nigeria to do research. I had a Kenyan graduate student, Jabril Herbo, who comes from this tiny ethnic group called the Burji, which is on the border of Ethiopia and Northern Kenya. Amazing guy who like, you know, somehow just through sheer determination, went to school, went to University of Nairobi, worked at a research center in Kenya. That's where I met him, came to my lab, and then as a technician and then a PhD student. And so he led a lot of the field work in Kenya and uh, just did a remarkable job, um, including going to places on the border of sort of kind of near Sudan, Ethiopia, um, Kenya. That's not the safest area. And I kept saying, well, I don't know if that's a good idea. But he's like, it's my homeland. <laughs> like, this is where I'm from. You can't tell me not to go back to my home. Um, and so he, uh, yeah. And then also I've had other people, um, Alessia Ranchiaro has led a lot of the research in my lab. I had children um, after, in uh, 2003. So after that, that kind of put a little bit of a damper <laughs> on the uh, field work. So I can't go for extended periods at a time. I do still go back, but I can't lead the expeditions for as long because as time went on, so when I first did this, we were going for about three to four months per expedition. I would basically leave for the entire summer. Um, after I had my first child, when she was about 10 months old or so, I went back for about a month. Um, ever since, I roughly go back maybe about a month per year, I, or I'll do multiple trips, mainly dealing with the work of um, meeting and establishing, collaborate, meeting collaborators, establishing collaborations, meeting with the government people, meeting with the ethics board. Uh, it takes a long time if you're going to do this work properly. I would say the average amount of time just before you even get in the field is probably five years. The longest time was nine years, the shortest two to three years or something. I mean, so you have to go there and find your collaborator and you have to write detailed proposals and you have to go through ethical review. And sometimes you go through multiple levels of review at different government organizations. And those are not quick and they always will tell you to make changes and then you'll make changes and then again and again and again. <laughs> Until if you're just really persistent, eventually you can do it and get through. But that way, you know, we're making sure that it's done ethically and done properly, which I think is a good thing. But it takes a long time to do this. And now in like starting in 2010, um, actually in 2009, I was really fortunate and I got a um, NIH Pioneer Award. And that was fantastic because it gave me this amount of money that allowed me to do, you know, whatever I want and to go in new directions. And, you know, the fact is there's not a huge amount of funding for doing field work in Africa. And so that gave me funding. And starting in 2010, we started doing a lot more phenotype analyses, like characterizing cardiovascular traits and anthropometric traits. And then we started bringing liquid nitrogen so that we could freeze the plasma <laughs> and to freeze other biological samples. So that that really, let's just say that, <laughs> that went from like three to four months to now like six to seven months per expedition. So the more information, the more detail we're getting in terms of ethnographic information, information about diet, information about anthropometrics and cardiovascular and you know any health information we can obtain, um, and then having to get liquid nitrogen, which typically, if there's a liquid nitrogen, and sometimes there's not in the country, but if there is, there's going to be one place often that has it. And that place is probably going to be a day to two days drive from wherever we are. 
and it only lasts every two weeks or so. So literally driving for days, getting the liquid nitrogen coming back, going back again. We also wanted to start establishing cell lines. Before we were just initially just getting DNA, then we started getting DNA and frozen plasma and RNA. We started getting fecal samples for microbiome, started getting urine samples for looking at um, uh, metabolism. And um, we became interested in setting up cell lines. That was a whole nother challenge. Um, previously, I was saying that we only got DNA and RNA and frozen plasma, but to get the cell lines, you have to do those in a hood in sterile conditions, ideally. And that meant we had to collect samples, transport them to some place where we could have access to a hood. Again, typically a day to two days away. We never knew if that was going to work because by the time you get the blood there, it's already been sitting for a couple of days. The cells are going to die off. Then you have to isolate the white cells, immediately freeze them, put them in a minus 80 or liquid nitrogen, ship them somehow to the U.S. frozen, making sure that they never defrost. And it takes a week to get back from the US, or from Africa to the U.S. So all kinds of logistics that have taken us, what, 15, 16 years to figure out. How has the H3 Africa initiative changed how this kind of field work is being done? So the H3 Africa initiative is, I think, having a big impact in the places where they have the collaboration. So Africa is a big continent and we're talking really different resources and really different infrastructure in different countries. And so I've seen the whole range. So if you're going to South Africa, for example, great infrastructure. I mean, you know, labs comparable to anything we'd have in the U.S. Kenya, Nairobi, really, some really good. Nigeria may have some really good. I've been to other places where it's not so good. And um, some places in Cameroon, for example, they till recently didn't have a really strong genetics uh, a, a laboratory set up for doing genomics research. Even now, you know, it's very rare that they would have sequencing machines. And even if they had sequencing machines, how are they going to get that repaired? How are they going to get the reagents there? People can't imagine the logistics involved of simply getting reagents frozen and keep them frozen and get them there in a timely manner. Or, you know, imagine here your machine breaks down. Okay, I'll just call up the sales rep. What do you do there? I think that nowadays we can, sh people can ship things off to be sequenced. And What's going to have a major impact is bioinformatics um, because that's something that anybody can do from anywhere at a computer. If they have computer access and have those computational resources, places that don't have the money perhaps for um, the infrastructure that goes into the laboratory equipment at least could play an important role in analyzing the data. So I think that's going to sort of revolutionize the genomics research there, but we have a long ways to go. So H3 Africa is definitely helping a lot. It's going to start with some of the, you know, key mainly urban areas and building up large sample sizes for doing genome-wide association studies that will start putting Africa almost, well, not even almost, <laughs> they're going to start catching up to what's being done in Europe and Asia. I don't think it'll totally get caught up. They'll start getting there. Um, but again, those are in pockets right? And there's still a lot of regions that still don't have the infrastructure, still don't have a program, still struggling. And um, that's a long-term project that I can't personally provide all that infrastructure that people need. I can provide training. We can train people at our lab. We can go there and give workshops. We can give lectures, hands-on training, but, you know, it's going to be a long-term effort, both in terms of getting funding from, um, external sources, you know, sources in the U.S. and in um, the uh, UK, in UK and elsewhere in Europe. But uh, there's going to have to be some buy-in from the local governments as well. And you can imagine that they've got a lot of challenges. And when people are starving, you know, or not getting health care, you know, they've got those very important issues to deal with as well. So starting to see some changes, I think we're moving in the right direction. We still have more, to, more ways to go. If you could design a project to address the issues you mentioned, what would it look like? You need a lot of money. <laughs> you would need a lot of money, a lot of resources to do that. I mean, I think H3 Africa took it a good, you know, they did a good thing in that they were saying, you know, this should ideally be led by people in Africa. There's always, you know, typically a uh, U.S. collaborator. 
but as much as possible um, building resources there. The only issue is that, of course, um, a lot of that funding is to collect samples and try to put together a public resource of samples. And I think that's going to raise a number of issues locally with people in Africa um, about do they want those samples to be available to everybody and what about the local scientists who put all that effort into it they you know they may not be able to work as quickly as some people from the u.s so they could get scooped basically and stuff that they work to collect all this data on um these are challenging uh issues to be addressed and i think there wasn't it was a lot of money but there still wasn't as much needed for the infrastructure for like actually putting in laboratories and um and uh, training programs. I think the Fogarty Institute also does a lot with uh, training programs, which is great. We just we just need more of it. I think somehow we've got to get the local governments involved more and more enthusiastic. Um, many of these places have great, um, they often are institutes of medical research sort of equivalent to the NIH. And I think if they join forces, there could be ways to do that. And maybe we also need some like philanthropy more donors <laughs> providing resources. So Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is great, but it's not really for basic research so much. It's more like very applied. So I think there needs to be also funding for basic research as well. How have improvements in sequencing technologies affected this kind of work? It certainly will help that as the technology gets better and cheaper, no doubt that it will become more affordable. I think that's going to certainly help. I think these like pocket sequencers or whatever i mean a lot i don't know how accurate they're going to turn out to be for basic science but in terms of like a diagnostic tool so if you're in the field and you need a diagnosis you know or, and also for just clinical purposes i think that could be really helpful um i think that we're going to be developing we'll have better biomarkers also for detecting disease so one challenge we have for example is tb super prevalent amongst many of the groups that we study but to actually diagnose TB, you're going to have to get like sputum and then you're talking about an infectious agent. You're going to have to go and like actually go to a lab and determine what they have. But if you're in the field and you need to know like right then and there, does this person have TB? Or if there was some way to get like a blood biomarker or something. I know people are working on that, but those kind of biomarkers would make it really much more feasible to do um, studies of infectious, common infectious disease in uh, remote parts of Africa. You know, prices are coming down, but come on, like over $1,000 per sample, I can barely afford that. <laughs> you know, so my colleagues in Africa, there's just no way. I mean, they're struggling to get basic reagents in many cases. They don't have funding um, opportunities. It's very hard for them. So, um, but I think in terms of, you know, the computational analysis, the bioinformatics, building strong collaborations, because... You know, if they're collaborating with people like myself in the U.S., the key is also to make sure that everything's shared so that samples are shared, data is shared, data should be transferred and shared. Ideally, um, their students or postdocs can be trained so that they can play a role in analysis. And so everybody's sort of participating together. Um, I mean, I think that can be also a way that even if, you know, if they don't always have the resources there for sharing that data and that information and they're playing an active role. That's a way that they can also be involved and hopefully someday be able to get their own funding to do the research there. So I think a lot of their funding right now comes actually from the UK, uh, MRC and Wellcome Trust. And um, the, there's been a history <laughs> very much in that and also other places in the UK or other places in, in Europe have done just traditionally have a lot more partnerships with uh, places in sub-Saharan Africa. And NIH is definitely building up that momentum and really getting involved. And the H3 Africa program really has helped a lot. And hopefully we'll sort of uh, pave the way for the future that we'll have more opportunities. Of course, you know, everybody's struggling for funding right now. So it's a matter of are we going to make that a priority and... Um, you know, that's something that NIH is going to have to decide. How do we talk about selection in African populations in a way that is responsible and scientifically correct? Well, whenever people ask me about is selection still going on, um, I say think about infectious disease, right? Because that's something people can understand and wrap their heads around. And we have this big Ebola scare. And you can imagine that um, an infectious disease can wipe out a population. 
or a large part of it. And it can happen pretty quick. And only those people who have some innate resistance to that disease are going to survive and pass on their genes. And so whatever those that variant or variants were that gave them some resistance are going to get passed on. And that you can imagine it can happen pretty darn quickly. So infectious disease is one of the strongest uh, forces of selection that continues to act today. And for those of us who work in remote areas, we see many children dying, sadly. We see this all the time. There's just not access to health care. It absolutely is occurring. Um, things like switches to diet we're talking about within the past 10,000 years. Um, I haven't actually been studying pollution. <laughs> you know, we're studying environmental, environmental factors that influence, say, traits or disease risk and how genes and environment together are influencing that. But mainly we've been looking at um, things like uh, adaptive traits that have to do with diet, so lactose tolerance, taste perception, uh, infectious disease resistance, skin color. Um, we're looking at a number of cardiovascular traits. We're getting very detailed into looking at metabolomics and um, looking at hundreds of lipids, for example, not just looking at HCL and, and LDL. We're also starting to look at the microbiome and see how um, that impacts and is impacted, you know, both gets, it's probably being influenced by genetics, but it's also influencing the physiology of the person and the metabolism. And it's very complex. We're sort of trying to look at how these different systems are interacting together to influence health and disease. How do you separate the genomic component of complex diseases from the environmental component? That's always the big challenge, trying to figure out how much is uh, genetic, what's genetic, what's environmental. But one of the advantages of working with uh, indigenous populations that are living traditional lifestyles is you do not have the env environmental heterogeneity that you have in an urban population. So if I'm working with a tribe, let's say a pastoralist tribe in a remote area of Tanzania, they have very little health access, unfortunately. So they're not typically going to be taking antibiotics or, or drugs um, unless if they're severely ill, then they'll end up going to the clinic or hospital. Um, diet. People will tend to eat same type of food, same day, all at the same time. <laughs> you know, there are no supermarkets. You're not going to get a lot of diversity of that in that. If, say, smoking is traditional and acceptable among men, well, then all the men are going to smoke, <laughs> you know? So... You've got sort of this homogeneity in terms of um, diet and number of environmental factors that I think is going to allow us to sort of tease apart the genetic components. So, for example, we rarely see diabetes. We rarely see obesity. We rarely see hypertension. You know, all of these diseases that are common in Western societies, we're rarely seeing there. But if we want to get down to what are the genes that are influencing pathways or, you know, that are related to cardiovascular function that when they go wrong can cause disease, I think we're going to have a good chance of being able to do that in these populations. Um, you can also take advantage of the fact that there's so much genetic diversity. And so I almost can think of it as like if you're interested in... Um, networks or pathways that are playing a role each variant is like a perturbation you know if you're interested in gene expression there's so many different variants that can be informative for looking at um, impact on phenotype um, the other thing is that sometimes you could take advantage of the fact that these are uh, very genetically diverse groups that have adapted to different environments so why are the pastoralists so tall and thin and some of the hunter-gatherers in Central Africa so short? They also have differences we found in things like blood pressure. We see pastoralist populations have significantly lower blood pressure, very different lipid profiles than other groups. What's going on with that? How much is that diet? How much of that is genetics? But if there's been selection, like if there, there's been adaptation to a particular environment, we may be able to pick that up using a like a scan for selection. And that might help us to sort of zoom in on what those genetic variants are, what those regions are. And that will give us also just a clue about sort of normal function uh, for whatever those traits are. And then sometimes you've got um, very diverse groups come in admix. So that's another general theme in all of humans and certainly in Africa. Yeah, we don't see many just homogeneous populations. They migrate, they come together, they admix. And, um, so you can sometimes take advantage of that admixture. It might be informative for what's called admixture mapping. The other thing is that 
some of these more remote populations, uh, some of the hunter gatherers, people who practice hunting and gathering, for example, like the Hadza population in Tanzania that we've studied for many years, their census size is on the order of a thousand. Now, on the one hand, we're never going to get to numbers for GWA studies that you do in Europeans, but I think there's still information there. And in that population in particular, because they have a history, we think they went through a severe population crash within the past maybe 500 years. And then given that there's only a thousand of them, there's some degree of inbreeding. They have these big giant tracts of homozygosity. If you look at two chromosomes, they're identical for millions of base pairs. Or if you look between people, they'll have tracts of their genome identical for millions of base pairs. That's kind of cool. That can help you disentangle sort of genetic and environmental factors and to map variants, like maybe rare variants that might be impacting cardiovascular, anthropometric, Good metabolic goodness. traits. Yeah, I mean, so I think they're gonna it's gonna turn out to be really, even though they're small, they're gonna turn out to be really informative. Mm -hmm.